first of all, I would like to introduce today's speaker in the upper corner. You see Sam Parsons, and he is a postdoc at the Department of Experimental Psychology in Oxford. And his research interest is adolescent worries. And of course, promoting open and reproducible research practices. With two fellow students two years ago, he founded the Repro Reproducibility Sean Club and also a, a podcast. And this uh, Sean Club received now well, wide international recognition. And um, as you can see, he's very young. And also as a young researcher, you can try to, to change something in the research system. And in principle, as he writes also on his homepage, he just likes us all to get along and do good research. So welcome, Sam, and we are looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank, thank you for that introduction. It's, it's really nice to, to be invited to a seminar series like this. Um, it's really nice to see more and more of these kind of popping up, um, and particularly ones that sound like they're supported by the department, the university as well. Um, I think all too often, the, these kind of efforts are so underground that we kind of miss out on the maximal benefit. Um, and having that support makes a huge, huge difference. Um, so I'll just grab the slides and we'll see if this works first time. Okay, uh, I'm hoping that the uh, closed caption works, maybe. Um, sometimes it goes funny because my voice is a bit dulcet. Um, so like I say, it's, it's really nice to, to be invited. Um, it's kind of nice to follow up on what I saw Brian's talk last time being in terms of uh, introducing in a way the cultural changes around openness and reproducibility that are going on and kind of how you can get involved that way and the changes that we're seeing. Um, it kind of gives me a nice opportunity to go through replicability and reproducibility broadly, I suppose. Um, my intention is to be to kind of go through things relatively quickly um, and perhaps shallowly for some of the, the papers that I'll discuss, um, but more to give an overall impression of kind of issues surrounding replicability and reproducibility. Um, and also to kind of reflect on, in some ways, some of the changes in my thinking about these over time. Um, because everything's changing so, so, so quickly at the minute. Um, so I thought we'd start with a little bit of high school maths. Um, so given, given four points, solve the quadratic equation, x squared plus five x equals minus six. Um, I won't ask anybody to actually do it, but here's the answer. So we know that the answer is minus two and minus three. Um, and if, if your instructor, if your reviewer is anything like my kind of high school teachers, you'd get hardly any marks because you've only given the answer. And what I find interesting is that this is exactly the state of academic literature. We give the answer, we give the final results, but we don't often actually show our working. Um, and there's some issues there, I think. Um, so the nice thing about showing showing the working um, is that you demonstrate that you can actually understand and implement the process behind getting the answer. Um, it not only shows that you've done that correctly, but it also shows that kind of everything's working as it should. Um, in this particular way, we can kind of see that there's two ways of getting to the answer, which is nice as well. So we can kind of cross validate different approaches. Um, and we can also sort of see where things go wrong as well. So in this kind of alternative example, uh, I think the, the two is missed out of the, the quadratic equation on the, on the right hand side there. And in this case, at the very least in terms of what I remember from high school maths, you still get marks for following the process. So even though a mistake was made, it's not the case that you kind of lose out on everything by having an incorrect result. Now, part of this, again, is because you're demonstrating that despite that minor error, you've still kind of engaged in the whole process correctly. Um, you can still understand what's going on. The benefit of this, again, is that we have cross-validation. Um, we can see that if a different approach gives a different answer, then one of them, if not both, must be 
kind of error prone in some way. It allows us to correct the answer, which I think is just as important. Um, so I'll talk near the end of the presentation about computational reproducibility, but I just want to kind of get up on my high horse for a second and sort of say that we, we expect children, teenagers to actually show they're working. And I would argue that we should expect that from researchers as well. Obviously there's some more complications in that because if it's not two lines, but given that we have years and years more training, given that there's an awful lot more riding on the results that we put out in the world, I think this is an expectation that we can push forward with. Um, so as, as we go through, I kind of, I encourage us all to, to bear in mind kind of two questions from, uh, from this and hopefully we can reflect on some of this at the end as kind of what can we do as an early career researcher as part of this overall community um, but also specifically to you and your research what can you do kind of on your own or within your own projects um, and we'll come back to these a little bit later as well. Um, so I think it's useful when we think about reproducibility and replicability to define them up front, um, particularly as, as we'll see, even some of the most prominent uh, papers discussing, discussing these issues confuse terminology. Um, so I'll stick to the Turing Way terminology, whereby reproducible describes uh, running the same analysis on the same data um, in the expectation that the results should be the same. Uh, I'll probably refer to this more often as computational reproducibility. Um, and in, that, in the same vein, uh, replicable uh, would then describe using different data or new data um, with running the same analysis. Uh, I'll also mention robust um, analyses a little bit as well. Um, so to describe how we would hope that our results are robust against minor changes in the analysis itself, given the same data set, um, because after all, we all have the same n by p matrix in theory. Um, I won't touch too much on generalizability because as we might get on to discussing later, um, when we kind of open up the question of what is a replication and particularly what is the distinction between, for example, a direct replication and a conceptual replication, I think that kind of crosses over with generalizability a bit. So I'm not gonna focus on that too much. So let's start with replications, given that in many ways, this is kind of, I think, where at least the field of psychology started to see that things were going a little bit wrong. Um, so again, thinking about different data, but the same analysis. Um, now, the first thing I'll point out is that despite this being a many labs replication project, the very title of the paper is about the reproducibility, which is a shame. Um, and it's something that's come up a few times. Um, but this is about the replicability. So uh, for those that haven't seen it, the, uh, in the figure there, the left-hand side, we see the original studies. So almost every study had a significant effect that um, 100 labs kind of had a go at uh, replicating. Um, and we see on the, on the right side of the figure there that the p-values in the replications kind of varied all the way from kind of almost zero to almost one. We see that only just over a third of the studies kind of replicated if you use the criterion of kind of statistically significant as well. Um, now again, this might be expected in some ways, um, but we'll get onto that later. When we look at the effect sizes, um, I always think effect sizes show something a bit more interesting than p-values themselves. Um, we see that the, the mean replication effect was about half of the original effect size. Um, and I guess, hopefully, surprisingly, about a quarter of the effects were actually in the opposite direction to the original. Um, now this, this paper itself caused a big stir. Um, there's also several issues with the paper um, in the sense that a one-shot replication attempt might not actually be giving us a full picture of how replicable that particular effect is, um, because essentially we have then two observations. 
albeit most of the studies, um, most of the replication attempts were much, much more highly powered than the original. Um, so there's an awful lot of reasons why results might not replicate. Um, I, I like to think of science being a liar sometimes as my kind of go-to for sampling error. Um, but more specifically, um, I think the, the usual kind of go-to is that maybe the original was a type one error. Um, and of course, this is more likely if the uh, original study had very low statistical power. Um, uh, I think Richard Morey had a nice example of if you try and compare an extremely blurry picture, an original picture, to a kind of very highly defined, uh, very clear picture as the replication. If that original is so blurry or the confidence interval is so wide due to low power, um, then actually it's really hard to just compare these effects in the first place. Um, we also know that with low power, um, comes a higher probability of significant results being type one errors. Um, so that's definitely a, a possibility. Um, I think it's all too often an easy go-to um, in that we also know that type two errors are a thing, um, so false negative. Um, and that's always a possible possibility. Um, more, more often than not, I think, especially in the early days of these kind of replication attempts, Sometimes there was a bit of defensiveness. Um, sometimes there was, uh, yeah, d defensiveness, suggesting many, many variants of kind of hidden moderators that might explain why one study observed an effect or not. Um, I think it's, as we'll see in the Many Labs 2 study, um, all too often some of these differences are more down to um, just sampling error rather than specific moderators. Um, but the usual ones are kind of, well, our lab group's trained in this certain way. Your sample is different. We tested only on a Sunday. Um, and many, many just ranging from very valid to very kind of bizarre. Um, and so I think that's worth investigating. Uh, the Many Labs 2 is a really cool one because they attempted to replicate 28 effects many, many times. Um, largely to look at the heterogeneity um, of those replications with most of the heterogeneity um, across the effect sizes being down to the actual effect trying, uh, trying to be replicated rather than kind of anything to do with differences between the studies. Um, so there was some heter heterogeneity down to things like the task or the, whether the task was administered online or not. Um, and only if three of them showed some evidence for a moderation by the weirdness of the sample. Um, I think what's important here, kind of my big take home is that what we really need to do is think in a kind of meta-analytic way about collections of effect sizes. So if we only have one replication attempt, then we kind of only, we only have two data points and it's much, much harder to therefore determine whether that effect quote unquote, exists or not. Whereas in this case, we have more than enough replication attempts to kind of have a distribution. And I always think thinking about that uncertainty around the effect is really useful. Um, a nice discussion point that we uh, could probably go on to later is whether it's possible to run a direct replication. Uh, Brian Nozick has a nice um, discussion on this. And my, my take home, I guess, is that there's a huge kind of gray area in what we might describe as being a replication and what flexibility we would allow to changes in the procedures or samples and still expect that effect to replicate. Um, and that's where I think the line between replication and generalizability can kind of get blurred a little bit sometimes. Okay, robustness. So we'll quickly go through the Many Analysts project because I, I love it so much. Um, so they had a 29 teams, uh, so many analysts, trying to run the same question and the same data. Um, the question being whether referees are more likely to give red cards to dark skin tone players rather than light skin tone players. And interestingly, uh, everyone got different results, um, largely because everybody tried slightly different analyses. Um, now, when I say different results, I mean the point estimates were different, the confidence intervals slightly different, 
largely the confidence intervals across the analyses overlap, which is encouraging, I think. It does sort of suggest that there is a sort of, I guess, a central tendency almost for the effects. Um, but it does demonstrate how dependent our analyses can be on the analysis done um, and the kind of appropriateness of that. Um, so it's well worth kind of considering things like uh, sensitivity analysis, for example. So running several slightly different analyses. I've seen it with, do we run with or without this particular covariate, with or without outliers, these, these kind of things. I, I think they're really valuable to demonstrate how robust the analyses are, depending on the slightly different results, or depending on the slightly different changes in the model, for example. Um, brings us nicely to the Gardner Forking Paths, which I, I think about far, far too much. Um, so this idea that we make so many decisions on the pathway between having our data and having our results. Um, and any number of those paths could give kind of almost any combination of results, particularly if we only consider a kind of dichotomy between significant and non-significant. Um, and the problem being, of course, the more contrasts we have, the more likely we are to find a significant result. And if we base our path, our decisions on the result itself, then we have problems. Um, so again, sensitivity analysis are a nice way of kind of running this. Another way is to run a multiverse where you kind of run all of the analysis or analyses. Um, so in this quite busy plot, just very briefly, each point uh, in the top panel is an effect size estimate. In this case, reliability, but that doesn't matter too much. Um, and they each represent a different combination of all of the different data processing decisions that could have been made to go into it. All of which are potentially arbitrary and you would hope wouldn't make too much of a difference on the results. But in this case, we see that the, in this case, the reliability of a cognitive measure can vary from anywhere between kind of highly negative to highly positive. And in that case, I think the, the robustness of that particular result we might want to call into question. Okay, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of computational reproducibility, um, largely because I think this is kind of the one that we have the most control over. We, we can't control our results. Um, we can't control whether the effect that we've found or not exists or not. But what we can do is put steps in place to make sure that given the same data and running the same analyses, the results come out the same. Or at least I would hope so. Again, coming back to our, our maths example. Um, so there's a preprint from Tom Hardwick and colleagues that tested whether results um, were fully reproducible on uh, studies that had open data badges. Um, and actually 10 out of the 25 studies that they looked at, they couldn't fully reproduce the values in the study, given the same data set. Um, and even with most of those cases having kind of some assistance from the original authors, which to me again, brings back the old, um, if we truly go back, back a step to what we're told, for example, a methods section is supposed to be, enough information that someone else can actually replicate your study and your results and your data analysis plan, I guess, um, so that other people can run the same analyses. It suggests that even there, there's something that's missing. Um, there's also a, a similar study that looked at, I believe, registered reports with open code, which again, you would definitely hope that there's computational reproducibility there. And I think even there, there were enough cases of irreproducible results that it suggests that something is kind of missing from that process. And again, this is the part that we as researchers kind of have the most control or individual control over. Uh, another thing I'm a big fan of is stat check. Um, so for those that haven't come across it, it's a basically a spell check for your statistics. So taking, taking your APA formatted statistics, so for example, uh, your, your F statistic and the associated uh, degrees of freedom, does the p-value match? Uh, and they actually found an awful lot of studies that contained 
an inconsistency. So in this case, probably due to a rounding error or something like that, in most cases, um, the statistics just don't match. Um, but about one in eight kind of had one of these gross errors that could have changed the pattern of results. So for example, uh, describing a p-value of 0 0.053 as less than 0 0.05, which is it a rounding error? Um, I don't know. I think it's probably not, but I don't want to overinterpret the intentions. Um, stat check's also really useful because you can run it on your own papers. Um, and more than anything, it's just a nice way to catch, catch potential. I'll call them inconsistencies rather than errors because I think error can be a bit of an emotive kind of term. Um, and the point of these kind of tools isn't to kind of flag uh, poor behavior or anything like that. So I'd like to kind of come back to the question of, as a community of early career researchers, what we can do. And also as individual researchers, what, what can we do um, ourselves? And I think for me, at least in terms of reproducibility, um, we kind of can't control replicability, but what we can control is reproducibility, at least of our own work. So I, I kind of encourage everybody to ask whether your work is computationally reproducible. Um, if you were to give your lab mate your, um, your data, do they have the tools in place to be able to get the same results as you? Um, largely, I think this comes down to coding. Um, I think from the discussion earlier, I'm not sure what departments everybody's from, but if there's imaging going on, then I imagine pretty much everything's coded which is nice. Um, in my experience in psychology departments, code is often not taught anywhere near early enough. Um, and there's an over-reliance on software that kind of actually manipulates the data set itself as opposed to um, kind of keeping it safe. So I, th I think what we can do is, is learn to code. Ideally learning to code in such a way that um, can a, be reproducible, um, but also a way that can provide enough information for other people to reproduce those results. And I think that's, that should always be within the scope of what we can do, what we have the power to do. Not to say that it doesn't take time, um, but there is something really satisfying about, for example, putting together an R markdown document, changing, a, changing an analysis slightly and clicking go and just having the full paper there knowing that you're never going to have to run something like stat check because the results are just exactly what, what came out of the analysis itself. Um, I'd encourage, um, so I, I've got the 21 word solution uh, taped up somewhere in my office um, next to my desk, just purely, I think many of us probably couldn't for most studies, honestly, report that we determined everything in advance uh, everything's fully there and all measures were there because chances are something was forgotten and we then removed an outlier later and then we had to rerun it for legitimate reasons um, or a reviewer suggested a, an extra analysis or something. But I think this is also one of those aspirational goals that we can maybe aspire to if we think about this as we're planning a study then we can also have that sort of checklist in mind of, okay, so what do I need to do to make sure that everything is transparent? And a huge part of reproducibility, I think, is transparency more than anything else. Um, so I, I find it compulsory for myself to, to big up the early career researchers within kind of any of my talks, because while there are many, many senior researchers that are kind of helping uh, get the message out with openness and reproducibility. I think the, the large part of most research efforts comes from early career researchers, whether that's because they're the ones collecting the data, actually running the analysis itself, um, and all of those kind of aspects. Might differ from field to field, but that's definitely the bulk, I would say, of psychology. Um, is to mention that all of this takes time. Um, so we kind of need to be kind to one another and to ourselves 
in terms of implementing all of these practices um, because it is hard and I think all too often because for example we're the ones who are going to have to format the data to make it open, who are going to have to put the code together to make that open, who are going to have to check everything to make sure that it's reproducible. An awful lot of the weight kind of does fall on early career researchers. Um, so I think one of my answers to what we can do as a community is to support one another. Um, ultimately, I think because in my mind, openness and reproducibility kind of comes down to something like this Nathan Power comic whereby none of the process is about whether your hypothesis was supported or not. It's all about showing you're working and demonstrating that what you've done is robust and transparent and I guess scientifically grounded um, and being complimented for doing science rather than storytelling some kind of pretty results. Um, I think that gives us a decent amount of time for, for conversation about anything, really, whether it's points that I've brought up or any more general things. I'd encourage it to be a nice conversation. Um, it doesn't have to be questions for me specifically. Um, the slides are here, and there's also just all of the, the references and tools and everything on the final page there as well. Um, so I'll leave that for just a brief second or I can copy the slides in. I'm guessing it might be shared afterwards. Um, and so thank you for, for your attention. <laughs>